What's good, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Dope and Damage podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today's guest goes by the name of Lucas, and I'm going to have him tell you what he's doing and what he's all about. Lucas, thanks for being on the show today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> so tell us, what do you do? What are you all about? What's your mission? Um, well, th- those are big, those are widely varied questions, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Um, my mission is, uh, very different from what I do. Oh, really? Um, Okay. Yeah. Then let's start with what you do. What, what I do right now, I do, um, I do three different things. I'm, I'm actively an entrepreneur. I own some retail flooring stores. So like carpet and hardwood, um, more than one. Um, I, I have a consulting business where, Um, I have, for those of you who are listening, you can't see, I have the Pokemon proudly uh, displayed over my shoulder here. Um, (laughs) The Pokemon client is my largest and longest standing client. Um, I've been with them for six years. uh, And what I do with them is I do their execution. And so what that means is kind of like the Pokemon company and the Apple company are, are two really good examples of the kinds of clients that I work with. Um, and there are others. Uh, they want to be really super focused inside their brand on building content and making sure that's the content that their audience wants to receive. It's kind of like you. And then in order to make that business work, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that needs to happen. There's, you know, merchandising that needs to happen. And then it needs to be delivered to stores where you can go buy it. And there's um, cards that need to be created and there are distribution channels set up and a a huge amount of execution that needs to be done. Um, And so the Pokemon company hired me actually six years ago, and I've been with them six years to uh, execute all of that stuff for one of their lines of business. Wow, that's amazing. So how did you score that? Like, did you know anyone working there or how did they find you? I did, how- actually. Okay, um, okay. So so for you who are listening, this is the value of networking right here. Um, I, uh, you great. know, you go to like conferences and conventions and stuff and you're like, this is fun. And it's like a paid vacation, right? It's Trust me when I say this, it's a lot more than that because you're going to meet people there that will become, you know, a a job or a client or um, a supplier, a vendor for you at some point in the future. And that's where the real value for things like conventions is. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, you know, I go to, I go to conventions. I've been going to business strategy conventions. I've been going to project management conventions. And I got to know one of the directors at the Pokemon company. And they, you know, they didn't need me, but we got to know each other. We knew each other fairly well for several years. And then in 2015, um, the Pokemon company started working on and they released it in 2016. So everybody knows about this is, is Pokemon Go the game. Yep. And they were like, this is going to be huge. And so they reached out through their directors. So somebody I knew, um, they reached out to everybody who does business strategy, which includes me. Mm-hmm. Now I got lucky in that that was also the time when I was looking to launch myself as a business strategy consultant. So they brought me in. We we had a, a nice conversation. I pitched them on a whole bunch of ideas and they were like, um, most of your ideas are, don't make sense for us. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. But there's this one idea that you pitched that we really like. Um, we're going to bring you on for not very much money. It was $2,000 a month, my first contract with them. We're going to bring you on for not very much money and we want to see what you can do. And that was six years ago and I'm still with them. I hope they raised the paycheck. <laughs> it's, it is. Yeah, I'm doing better than 2000 a month now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's great to hear. That's really, really great to hear. That's amazing. That's really interesting actually, because that's what I always say. I, I, for me, networking is everything. If people don't realize sometimes that you meet someone and you might not use them or need them right then and there, but there is a later, there is a future. Yeah, (laughs) that's exactly right. Well, see, Um, I'm, I'm glad uh, you confirmed it. So what's your mission? Right. So those are the things that I do that get me paid. I I also actually have a coaching business where I work with people on how to be, um, how to, how to live their purpose. Mm -hmm. 
and um, how to be productive while they're doing it. Because I don't know if you've noticed this. I mean, you look out in the world and you see um, you see people who are theoretically living their purpose, like, you know, they show up as they're living their purpose or whatever. But um, me personally, I've noticed that those people often are not very good at being focused. They're not mm-hmm. very productive. They, they haven't built the tools and strategies and techniques into their life that allow them to create consistent and replicable success. Um, and so I, I run a coaching business that helps people doing that. So those are the sort of three things that I do that bring in some money. And then um, some of the things that I do to sort of lift up the world. And I haven't figured out how to monetize these things yet. And, mm-hmm. and I think this is a piece of how I live my purpose. And that's um, I'm, I mentor startups. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm specifically focused on female CEOs. Wow. Oops. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> My, uh, I, you know, there, there are lots of examples that, that could have been this like crystallizing moment for me, but about three and a half years ago, I saw a statistic that said, uh, women three and a half years ago, get less than 5% of, um, VC funding. Mm -hmm. Now that number since three and a half years ago has gone down. Really? Yeah. So it's actually worse now than it was three and a half years ago when I saw that, but but I was like, what, this is, this is absurd. I mean, really it's, it's, it's so ridiculous. It should be laughable. Should be, it is not laughable, but it should be. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a scientist. I, I come from a scientist background. Um, you know, the, the world of science is littered with um, stories of truly extraordinary women. Madame Curie is one of my favorite stories. Oh, okay. For those of you who don't know, Madame Curie was the very first scientist, not just woman, but scientist, to both win a Nobel Prize outside of her discipline and to win a second Nobel Prize. Very first scientist for both of those things. She is extraordinary. She's absolutely amazing. That was 110 years ago. Yep. 110 years ago. I want to know, and there is no answer for this. I want to know why 110 years ago, we didn't look at her and say, um, obviously women are far more extraordinary than our our society gives them credit for. So let's change the way that we're dealing with this 110 years ago. And certainly there are examples before that that could have been crystallizing, right? There are examples after that that could have been crystallizing, but You know, I'm looking at this one moment in history saying, why didn't we take that and galvanize around it and say, hey, we're doing this wrong. Let's do better. And instead, over the last 110 years, we've as a society, we've forced women to fight for equal opportunity, which means they're wasting. It's it's not a waste for you women. You have to fight. You have to do this. But it's a waste for me as a consumer. It's a waste for us as a society. They're wasting effort and energy to get to the equal opportunity level so that they can produce, that they can bring their ideas to market, that they can improve the world and create products that I as a consumer want to receive, right? Yes. It's 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 horrible. And um, so three and a half years ago, I was like, hey, I'm going to be mentoring startups anyway. I have several of my own. I think I'm going to focus on women. Because I want to see women succeed. I like that. But is this, um, I mean, was this just really like seeing the statistic being so wrong? Or do you like also have like maybe family members that are women who've been trying to, you know, um, do stuff, trying to start their own business and you, you see them struggle? Um, I wish. I'm the only entrepreneur in my immediate family. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm the only one. <laughs> Um, well, I, I don't know what to say right now. Like, I want to thank you for taking on uh, our female fight. And at the same time, I'm like, wow, this is really crazy. Like guys, actually men feel to fight for us. I don't know. Like, <laughs> it's a little bit. Yeah, it's cool. I'm not the I only like one. <laughs> I'm not the only one. You, you've got brothers and fathers and husbands that would fight for you, too. Absolutely. And and I think that's great. I think that's exactly what the world needs, you know. Um, so do you do you have any 
female employees? Yeah, uh, most of my employees are female. Um, I knew in, you was going to say that. That's why business. I asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all of my other senior leaders in my businesses are all female. Um, the 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 women I work with are amazing. They're they're very intelligent. They're they're um, they're focused. They've got the right drive. They um, I can trust them to make decisions as though I were in the room and I don't have to be. I I can trust them. Like they're incredible. Like, these are top notch, high performance, amazing people, and they're women. That's really great. I like that. <laughs> So how do you uh, go about um, seeking out the kind of startups that you um, mentor? Do you do you look for them or do you uh, have people reach out to you? How do you really like find these women that you like to support? Yeah, um, about half of them have come to me. Mm -hmm. So they they found me either through a podcast like this mm -hmm. or, you know, LinkedIn or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other half I get through, uh, either one of two, uh, different sources. So I'm, 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 I'm a go-to mentor for a VC called the loyal VC, mm -hmm. uh, VC for those of you who don't know is venture capital, um, venture capital firms invest in startups with the hope of, you know, making a whole bunch of money when the startup gets to an exit at some point in the future, mm -hmm. right? They, they, they grow, they get strong, they sell the business, the VC makes money. Um, it's, you know, the way the stock market works only sooner and hopefully better earlier in the process of, of the life of that company. So I've, I'm a go-to mentor for a VC. Um, mm -hmm. I, I also partner with the INSEAD MBA program. INSEAD is, um, one of the largest MBA, pro MBA programs in the world. Um, and one of the things that INSEAD does that I really appreciate, and I, I don't always see this in MBA programs, but, but these guys do, is they have this thing called the launch pad where their MBA candidates are strongly encouraged to start up a company while they're in the MBA program. Um, and then the launch pad actually helps them do that. It provides a little bit of grant funding. It gives them a workspace. Um, and then it gives them access to people like me to be able to help them, you know, build this business idea and move it forward. And maybe it'll succeed, maybe it won't, but but at least they started, right? And yep. you and I both know, like, the hardest thing to do is to actually get started. Really? See, this is my thing. For me, the this is not the most difficult thing to get started. Like, I'm a person... I have an idea and then, you know, like I sit on it for a while and then I try to find out, okay, how can I, how can I realize this? What can I do? Who can I talk to? You know, my biggest problem is always to, um, I know it sounds crazy because maybe it's actually not so difficult, but my biggest, uh, my, my, the biggest problem is some, sometimes to be heard or be seen by, by those kind of people. You know, let's say you, you approach an investor or something like that. I feel especially as a woman, a lot of the times you don't get taken serious enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, and in some cases, that's, uh, that's exactly true. They're, people absolutely carry a bias. There's a bias in society at large. But how, um, do, you, how do we go about it as women? Yeah. So you have unique advantages that um, in in part have been fostered. Maybe they're genetic. I don't know. I don't have an opinion on this, mm -hmm. um, but but certainly have been fostered by the bias in society. So, you know, look at all of the populations, women included, but all of the populations in society that are, you know, underdog populations. Those people have to fight to get to the point where they have equal opportunity and the fight that they put in becomes one of their greatest strengths. Right? Yes. The same is true for women. You had to fight to get to the point where you're sitting across that table from that investor. So you know that you worked harder to get there than any of the other people they met with that day, that week, that month even. And you know that you're going to keep working harder on the back end because working hard is not an attribute. It's not something we're born with. Mm -hmm. It's a habit. Absolutely. 
And anyone who had to bust through cement walls to get to that table, anyone, you included, has built that habit of working hard. And you're not going to stop doing that tomorrow when you've finally got some, some momentum. You've finally gotten to the point where you're not like climbing up a wall. Instead, it's just a steep hill at this point, right? Pardon the metaphor, like the, the working hard that you're willing to do is 10 levels more than, you know, pardon the other side of the bias, the white man that they met with before you and will, you know, the other white man that they're going to meet with after you, that That's person, they, they didn't have to work anywhere near as hard to get to that table. And they aren't going to work anywhere near as hard tomorrow when they've gotten funded. You know that. That's number one. Number two. Definitely. Um, Often women in society today, this isn't universally true, but it is, you know, there's there's a reason why we have um, stereotypes, right? Often women um, take care of a huge number of things in in their combined lives, huge number of things, more than men in general. So an investor on one side of the table is going to look at you and think, well, your life is complicated and I don't want to deal with that. But that's, again, just like working hard, that's your strength. That's your strength. You know that you can handle complicated. You know that you can handle an enormous amount of tasks. And starting a business is that. It is the essence of that. There's so many things, so many varied tasks, so many issues, so many complications that are just going to show up all the time. And again, whether it's genetic or societal, women happen to be much, much better at that just in general. They just happen to be better at that. So when you're sitting there at that table, you've got, you've got the investor's ear. They're listening. They're paying attention. When you're sitting there at that table, bring up those things. Put your cards on the table and say, here are the things that, that I'm amazing at that are going to turn me into me, that are going to turn me into a good bet because of the fact that I'm amazing at them, because of the fact that I've had to be good at this because of the role that I play in society, the role that I play in my life, I'm amazing at these things. I'm amazing at handling everything, everything. Imagine what a mother does, like seriously, a new yep, mother. Yep. yep. I, I don't know if you have kids, but like- No, but I know exactly what you're talking about. They, they, the moms are phenomenal. They're holding a baby in one hand, putting a diaper on it. They've got a phone to their ear. They're Absolutely. cooking, they're cleaning. <laughs> and sometimes all of these things actually simultaneously, like six, seven tasks all going actually simultaneously. Men can't do that shit. Definitely <laughs> not. Men can't do that. <laughs> Men can even do two things at once uh, many times. So <laughs> you, you take that strength, that, uh, that amazing abundance and capacity to handle concurrent tasks and to do it well, consistently over and over and over again for months and years at a time, that right there is something that's worth betting on. Okay. Okay. I will remember that. I hope the listeners will too, the female ones. <laughs> I don't know so, if you can hear the passion in my voice. Absolutely. <laughs> It's just very interesting to me that you say, like, put the, the, the cards on the table and be basically open with it. And, you know, like talking about the role that a woman plays in society, because I would have thought men don't want to hear that shit. No, but what investors want to hear is what's going to make them money. Yes. And yes. betting on you because of the fact that you're amazing at those things. And those are the things that are going to sink a business. How do you focus on the operations over here without losing track of the fact that you might run out of money tomorrow? Or yeah. if you're focused on the money, how do you focus on the operations? How do you build an amazing team while you're also trying to deal with vendors and coming up with the right product concept and working with your customers to make sure that they understand the product concept and that it makes sense with what you're working on and not running out of money? So do you, when you, when you, um, when you work with a startup or when you mentor a startup, do you also go by what the, what the business is or what the idea is? Like, let's say you see, okay, this idea is not really that great. 
would you actually say that or would you just like say, okay, this, the startup I don't work with, would you like, do you sometimes try to help make an idea better or tell them, Hey, you know what? I don't think this is feasible. Mm -hmm. You do. Absolutely. Yeah. All okay. the time. That's yeah. good. I mean, that's what, that's what they have me there for. <laughs> and if, and if they don't think that's what I'm there for, then, you know, the relationship's not going to last for very long and that's okay. That's true. So what are the um, the kind of like um, difficulties you come across, like mentoring female startups? You know, or mentoring uh, startups, maybe on a whole, maybe I shouldn't base it on females only. It, it well, I mean, they're they're different bucket. Um, the, the, the male startups that I work with. Mm -hmm. the, probably the most consistent challenge I have with them is that um, they have a hard time accepting critical feedback on their product. Oh, wow. Um, the female startups that I work with have a, have different hard times, not that particular one. That's, that's not a challenge for them. Um, so, so what's their challenges? Yeah. Uh, the, the most consistent challenge I have with the female entrepreneurs I work with mm -hmm. is that um, they believe that in order for them to be effective, they need to be more like a man. That is so they need true. to be, they need to be more forceful. They, they need to be more uh, aggressive. They need to have a deeper voice. Um, men don't have that problem generally. I mean, there are some out there that do, but, but generally men don't have that problem. But how do, and this is, this is really true. Like I can definitely say this women have this thing where they have, where they think, okay, I need a certain presence, you know, to make an impact or to, um, to make a statement. So, so what do you, what do you advise them to do? Well, well how um, to get rid of that? Typically, uh, number one, typically by the time I'm working with them, they're already in revenue. They have, they have money coming in. They have successful customer relationships. Ah. They have a, They have a product that's working. There's obviously room for improvement, but typically they're they're already making revenue, not necessarily profit, but they're bringing in money. Yeah. So I point out, you've already started this business. There's a there's a product and a customer and a market that exists because of you right now, and nobody else could do that. Nobody else did do that. And so the only person that you need to be is you because it's you that got you this far. Absolutely. So switch lanes a little bit. Um, yeah. What's the best way to approach a CV, a VC, sorry, um, in the sense of like, like, how do you go about approaching these kind of companies as a woman, maybe even as a, as a male, that's not so... Um, you know, like, uh, how do I say, like who doesn't have many experiences, you know, mm -hmm. what's the best way? Um, if you don't have a lot of experience mm -hmm. and you have a, then, you have a project that's definitely, uh, very promising. Mm -hmm. Um, take a step back. Okay. Really, uh, find a way to uh, don't don't approach VCs yet find a way to shoestring bootstrap your business to the point where you have revenue coming in so you can see the numbers um a lot of people want to go to VCs right out the gate they have a good idea they have the right framework they think built mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but they don't have customers yet. They, they haven't launched the idea. They don't have a real product. They haven't tested it. VCs don't want to play with that. And I think that there's a big disconnect in the market of entrepreneurs and the market of VCs in that right there is that, you know, entrepreneurs think if they have a good idea, they can get it funded and, and VCs don't want to play with that. And, and I can tell you why. Please do. Because, um, every single business, every single one um, will pivot their first product. Every single one, it's a hundred percent guarantee they will pivot their first product. That doesn't mean that they're going to be a failure, but they will pivot their first product. 
And VCs know this. Investors know this. Non-VC investors know this. Um, you're guaranteed, 100% guaranteed to pivot your first product. Your first product is not going to be the one that gets you to success. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, VCs look at that as a huge risk because it is. It is a huge risk. And so um, what you want to do as an entrepreneur is you want to get to that first pivot on your own dime. Mm -hmm. Or family money, friends and family money is fine. You want to get to that first pivot on your own dime, get through that pivot, and then prove to the VC after that pivot that your next idea is the, is the winning idea, the pivot that you've got based on data. You pivoted because your customer interactions tell you that what the customer wants is this other thing instead of what you initially thought. You pivoted because this new product that you're bringing to market is cheaper, so it's going to have a much higher margin. You pivoted because you launched the second product because your customers were asking for it and it took off. And now you're just going to drop the first product because it's it's just not doing well enough to keep your attention. Those are the things that, v, that any investor wants to hear. They want to hear, here's what I'm doing now. Here's how I got here. Here's why I'm doing it this way based on the numbers, data, actual revenue that shows that the story you're telling makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> but what? But sometimes it's just like very hard, you know, to get started if you have an idea and you know money is the only thing you need. Yeah. Um, again, friends, family. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's not a joke. I've seen so many people get, you know, 10, 15, $20,000, which seems like a lot to an individual, but it's really not that hard to raise fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for a good idea. Not imp I mean, it is hard, not impossible. It is hard. Yeah. But but friends and family, um, get to you know, get to your first ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, launch the product idea, get customers. That's that's the path. All right, all right, all right. Well, <laughs> So does how do you do because you said you have this other coaching company do you do do you coach yourself or do you have people who do this I do the coaching myself You do the coaching yourself so um how difficult do you find it to coach people when like you know like you look left right and center and there's so many coaches out there what what is for you like the most important thing that makes you stand out from everybody else Hmm Great question. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> I, I wish everybody would ask that question. I have made some really bad coaching investments in my own life. Mm -hmm. um, I've invested in coaches that turned out to be a really horrible fit. Yeah. So when you're evaluating coaches, always me or someone else, when you're evaluating coaches, number one, check to see if their message is in the language that makes sense to you. Because you could have two different coaches that are equally amazing, excellent coaches. And let's assume that they are also the same price. One, one coach, same price, amazing. Other coach, same price, amazing. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. The one whose language makes sense to you, the way they talk, the way they interact with their audience, that's the one you need to be hiring. Because when they give you a message, you're going to be able to receive it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's going to mean that that coach, the one whose language makes sense to you, is going to be more effective for you. That's number one. Absolutely number one. Okay. Number two, make sure that the things that they have coached in the past are congruent with what you need today. Don't worry about what they have in their marketing message for what they're selling. That's not really what's important. Every single person, coaches, moms, cousins, every person who gives you advice is going to give you advice based on what they've done in the past. And the coaches that you hire are going to give you advice based on what they've done in the past, Yeah. regardless of what program they're selling. So pay attention to what they've done in the past. If you want someone who helps you start and run your business, then they had better have started and run the business and failed. 
and also started and run a business and succeeded. Because if they've only failed, then you're not going to get good coaching. And if they've only succeeded, then there's no way for you to know whether or not they were lucky and you're not going to get good coaching. You need someone who has failed and succeeded both. Right. I agree. Yes, absolutely. I agree. I think this is a very important point because it's the same thing like, you know, um, with 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 picking a therapist or whatever. I feel like, you know, if you have people who went through something and who experienced the stuff that they're talking about, um, you can definitely learn way more from them. Yeah. Now, a lot of this stuff can be distilled down to a framework that theoretically is teachable through a coach who has no idea, a professional mm -hmm. coach who's never been there and never done that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not discounting the idea that you could go to a program, say Tony Robbins, and, and get one of Tony Robbins' coaches to walk you through their framework and that it might actually create the opportunity for success for you. It might. Yeah. Most of the time, people are not hiring coaches for a framework. If I want a framework, I'm going to buy a book. Really? I mean, that's just me, but I'm you know, if I want a framework, I'm going to buy a book and get the framework out of the book and pay 20 or $30 for it. Um, if I want coaching, it's because I want somebody who can help me make micro adjustments real time in my life and in my business. And micro adjustments don't come from a framework. They come from somebody who has experience and is paying attention because it's their job. You're paying them to pay attention, but they have experience and they're paying attention yeah great advice <laughs> it's it's um it's good to actually know that um you know as you said like you also you know had to go through everything that a lot of people go through like experiencing some really bad coaches and also having a business that didn't work out for me it's always um, what's important is always the drive and the motivation to keep going and not give up. I've had two businesses that didn't work out. And, and yes, there's no lack of drive and motivation from me. Fortunately, I've had four businesses that have succeeded so far. So Who knows you, what tomorrow will bring? <laughs> okay. Yeah. But um, so now um, your main work or, or the, the main thing you're trying to figure out that you said in the beginning, which I think it's also very cool that you speak on it so so openly is that um you do all the work with the startups but you don't know how to monetize it yet and i think mm -hmm. this is also very important to hear it from someone who's successful and who says okay i do this and in a way it's, it's my passion project but i would like to um you know see something coming back to me off of that but um it's it's interesting to see that you still also like don't have the answers to everything you're still working on how to figure it out <laughs> It, that is, you are a hundred percent correct. I'm still working on that. I, I don't have the answer. Yeah, but it's, um, it's still cool. I like it. I like that you actually take your own time and that you invest your own time, which is, um, and it's, it's, it's a lot of, you know, it's time, it's patience, it's dedication and everything that you, um, give to people for free that, uh, is very valuable. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything I didn't what, touch what, on? What she said. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything I didn't touch on that you would like to talk before we go? Um, boy, we have touched on it all, haven't we? Oh, I have a course on how to work from home. It's on my website. Okay. We will have the website in the show notes. Um, so you do, you created this course? I did. Um so when the when the pandemic hit a year and a half ago, I was already doing coaching. And I'm, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the call, I've, I've been working with people on how to be productive and how to create consistent success. So it was it was in my wheelhouse. The Pokemon company called me up and said, hey, um, we're sending all our people home. So uh, they're all used to working in the office. They're now working from home. They don't have the right habits and tools to be able to be successful at home. Can you put together like an hour presentation for us? And I was like, yeah, of course. Like you guys are awesome. I've been working with you for a while. I'll do that. Um, and I did it and it went really well. So I said, well, um, maybe I should reach out to my network and see if people want to hear more of this. And obviously, you know, a year and a half ago, everybody wanted to hear all about it. And so it was like a huge hit. So I spent the next six months from about March until about August of 2020 
just talking to people about being successful at building productivity framework into their life so that they can be consistently successful Mm -hmm. at whatever they're doing, working from home for the man, uh, working from home for Pokemon, working from home, you know, for yourself to, to build your own business. Um, and in August I was like, I've been doing this for a while. I've got some recordings. Let me see if I can turn this into, you know, a, 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 a course that I can put up on my website and people can just like go buy it. So I did. And I launched it in November and uh, I think it's pretty good work. That's great. So, yeah, so we definitely will have the website out there um, for people because, I mean, it's all about now working from home. It's all about creating um, side incomes and side hustles and everything, you know. So, yeah, that's a, definitely a great um, course, I guess. Thank you. I might yeah. have to look at it myself. <laughs> yeah. I I recommend it. I think it's good stuff. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, where are you based, actually? Um, I live in San Diego, California. Okay, okay. Which I love. Um, Ironically, I have no clients here. So when I'm spending time with my clients, it's 100% I have to travel to get to my clients. The Pokemon company is is in Seattle, so that's a fairly long trip. I've got... I've got some clients in Denver. I've got some clients in Austin, Texas. So it's it's ironic that where I live, I have no business. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it's better that way. You don't think? Yeah, I mean, nice like to really the, come home and just like you know, not be like, oh my god, uh, like three blocks down, there is you know this client and they annoyed me today. You know. <laughs> yep, I might bump into them at the bar. Yeah, there's no chance of that. <laughs> exactly. So like, you have your full. The city of- is my life. Exactly. But well, well, I mean, I don't know how active you are on social media. Social media makes the world much smaller than it really is. So it sure does. It sure does. <laughs> Lucas, thank you so much for joining me today. I definitely uh, enjoyed this talk a lot, and um, I learned a thing once we here. <laughs> Oh, cool. Well, thank yes, you so definitely, much. Definitely. So, yes, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And um, thank you so much once again for tuning in wherever you're tuning in from. And I will be back next week with a brand new episode. Peace.